we can say amen to that. <laughs> amen to that. <laughs> That goes so well, too, with the message. Let's go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Title this, Righteous Judgment, Tender Mercies. The Lord Jesus one day said to some men who thought they were righteous and despised others, he said, search the scriptures. Now, brethren, search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Don't take any man's word for anything. You search the scriptures and ask God to give you an understanding. But he told them, he said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You think you're going to be saved by what you're doing. I think that's what this book's about. He said, and these scriptures are they which testify of me. We read about in Psalm 119, God's testimonies. That's what they are. Testifying Christ is, believe my son. <laughs> He's my salvation. And then he said, when the comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He shall testify of me. And he shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine. He'll, he'll take the volume of this book and he'll receive of mine and he'll show it to you. He'll show you Christ in these scriptures. Now it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit will show us Christ in our text this morning. The next section of Psalm 119 is the Hebrew letter Jod. You see there at the beginning of verse 73, each one of these sections is a Hebrew letter, and each word, at any, there's eight verses, and each word begins with that letter, John. Now, that letter, that word, is what our Lord called a jot in the Greek, a jot. That's what you and I would call the little dot on the I in our alphabet, a jot. The tittle is like the little crossbar on the T. Our Savior came to fulfill the law for his people. And he said this, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy. I came to fill them so full you can't put another drop in them. I came to fulfill them. So verily I say unto you till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. And he said, I came to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law. He's going to do that for his people. Now, the first Adam represented his people, but he was created upright, full grown, perfect in a perfect world with one law and no sinners to contend with. The last Adam is representing a fallen people, people who fell in Adam and became completely, totally ruined. I mean, if you take a dead man, he's laying there dead. That's what you are in your flesh from the moment you're conceived in the womb till you, they put you in the ground. You're a dead man in your flesh. So this last Adam, he's representing, representing his people from the womb. Because you had to be perfect in the womb. Throughout every stage of childhood, we had to be perfect. And he's representing his people through every stage of childhood. They circumcised him at eight days old. Paul said, every man that's circumcised is a debtor to keep the whole law. And, and from the beginning, he's keeping the whole law of God for his people. Through his teenage years, through his adult years, he entered his public ministry around 30 and was crucified around 33. The whole way from the womb all the way into the death of the cross, he served the Father perfectly. He's the one perfect man. 
And he did it in a cursed world surrounded by sinners who opposed him every step of the way. Every step of the way. When he said that to those Pharisees, he said it to them, and they despised him while he was saying it because they thought they were righteous by something they had done. Paul said the righteousness of God is manifest by the faith of Christ. Only place. And that means by the faithfulness of Christ, by his fidelity, by his life from the womb until he drew his last breath. That's where you're going to see the righteousness of God. He's the righteousness of God. Now, as we read our text, I'm just going to read the first portion, and then we'll look at the second portion as we go. But I want you to hear Christ Jesus speaking to the Father as the righteous, perfect servant of God in perfect faith and fidelity. This is Christ our righteousness speaking. Now listen, verse 73, Thy hands hath made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. First of all, the Lord Jesus only glorified the Father. He gave all the glory to God constantly. All of it. And he glorified the Father for making his fleshly body. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Now turn to Hebrews 10. This is quoted from Psalm 40, but I want to read a little more than is in Psalm 40. Uh, but this is quoted from there, and this is the Lord Jesus speaking. He was speaking in Psalm 40. You, you do better to hear Christ speaking in the Psalms, is we, where you're going to get the most out of them. He had to be made in all points like unto his brethren. Everything you need, he needed when he was serving up for us. He needed it. Now here he is, he's glorifying God for making him a sinless body in the womb. He says, Hebrews 10.5 Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. They never satisfied. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. That means everything in the scriptures is written of him. Every bit of it. I came to do thy will, O God. Thy law is within my heart. That's what the psalmist said, what he said in the psalm. And he came to do that because his people couldn't. That's why he came to do it. I came to do thy will, O God. To do it perfectly. Now watch. Above, when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first. He takes away the old covenant law that condemned us, that he may establish the second. We're going to talk about a law in our psalm. He established the second everlasting covenant of grace. That's the law his people are under. By the which will, by him, by his will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ one time. As a man, he lived holy in perfection and died holy in perfection and sanctified his people by one offering. Every priest stands daily ministering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Men in this world today are still offering sacrifices, works and whatever that can't take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And we're going to see something about some of his proud enemies in our psalm. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Remember how he said the Holy Ghost will speak of me. He'll take the volume of the book and he'll show you things concerning me. 
whereof the Holy Ghost also is witness to us. The Holy Ghost teaches us this. Colossians now, back in our text, he speaks of God as the creator. Colossians says Christ created all things. Our triune God is our creator. Now, all should bow and all should worship God. He's our creator. Everybody should. But because we sinned in Adam and came, became guilty, we come forth enmity against God, and all we mind is carnal things. You know what that is? That's searching the scriptures and thinking by the works we do, we have life by them. That's having a carnal mind set on the rudiments of the world, and that's all a carnal mind can focus on. That's what it's focused on. It's focused not Christ. It's what do I do to save myself? But God made his son a fleshly body because Christ came to make God's elect a new creation. Now, he created all the first creation, but he came to make a new creation entirely entirely of his making. God's elect were in Christ. That's where we were. God put us there in eternity. In Christ. Members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones, one with him from eternity, just like Levi was in Abraham's loins. And we were in that body when he came forth, even when he was in the womb. Christ speaks to the Father of his body and of all God's elect in him. Look at Psalm 139. He said there in our text, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Now look here at Psalm 139. This is Christ speaking, and he's speaking of that, that earthly body, but he's speaking also of his elect who make up his body that are in him. He said in Psalm 139, 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Our Savior praised God perfectly. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Kelsey's got a baby in her. That's what he's talking about. When I was in my mother's womb. When his body was created in the womb of the virgin, that's what he's talking about, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book, unperfect means not developed, in all thy book, all my members were written. Now get that, in God's book, all Christ's members were written. He wasn't just talking about his fingers and his toes of his physical body, he's talking about his elect people to make up his body. In his God's book, they were all written before the foundation of the world, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Just like his physical body came forth and grew and was fashioned, he's growing his a spiritual body and fashioning it by what he's done, by his hands. Now we believe and we bow and we worship God our Father and his Son Christ Jesus only when he gives us faith to believe that we were in Christ from his mother's womb, in him from eternity, but in him from his mother's womb, and that he made us entirely a new creation by what he did, by his hands, by his righteousness, by his obedience as our head. That's when we praise God, and that's when we say in verse 73, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. That's when we'll, that's when we'll give him the glory for it. Now, secondly, our Savior is God. But as a man, in perfect faith, the Lord Jesus looked to God our Father for everything, for everything, including wisdom. Now, he did this perfectly, brethren. He did this perfectly. We look a lot to ourselves. And as sin, he looked only to the Father. Look here in verse 73. Second part, he said, Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. Our Savior grew in wisdom as a man because God taught him. God told him he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. That's what God the Father promised to do in the covenant of grace before the world was made. Our Lord quoted Isaiah 
I want you to look at Isaiah 42. Our Lord quoted this, speaking about himself. Isaiah 42, verse 1. This is the Father speaking of our Lord Jesus. Christ said, Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. Here's what the Father promised him. He said to us, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He did it without measure. We just have the spirit in a measure. But he put it on his son without measure. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break. The smoking flax shall he not quench. That's his weak, weak people. He's going to deal tenderly and mercifully. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth. And the isles, the Gentiles, shall wait for his law, his people all over the world. As thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth, that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath to the people upon it, spirit to them that walk therein, I, the Lord, he's speaking to Christ now, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles to open their blind eyes to bring their, the prisoners out of the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Christ came to set us free. He came to set us free. We were already in bondage. He came to set us free. I am the Lord. See that? I am the Lord. That's my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. That's why he sent Christ. Everything man, fallen man tries to do in religion is nothing but the worship of an idol, self. He sent Christ to serve him perfectly because, and glorify him perfectly because he won't give his glory to an idol. And so Christ glorified him. Look at Isaiah 11, verse 1. He asked the Lord to give him understanding that he might learn the commandments of the Lord. Isaiah 11, 1. See, he came forth under the whole low covenant that God gave at Sinai. And he's asked, God, teach me these commandments. Now look at Isaiah 11, 1. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. David's writing our psalm, but... but God says, there's coming one out of, out of David, out of Jesse. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. He asked the Lord to give me understanding. This was God's Father's promise to him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of the eyes. He looks on the heart. He knows the heart. And he says, neither shall he reprove after the hearing of the ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. That's his people, the poor and the meek, the weak that can do nothing. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. He going to declare the gospel, and slay the proud and the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. We're going to see God's righteousness and his faithfulness. Now, so he asked God, he praised God for making his body, and he asked God to give him understanding that he might learn God's commandments. It is Christ, that we saw the Father did that to him in covenant, Covenant promise, just like he promised. It's Christ who's going to give his elect understanding. You remember what John said? Go to 1 John 5.20. Here's the understanding. He gives it, and here's what he makes you to know. This is the understanding he makes you to know when he calls you. 1 John 5.20. He said, we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. There's the understanding he gives you to know him. And we're in him that's true. That's the understanding he gives you. Even in his son Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. 
So little children, don't be looking to idols. Don't be looking anywhere else. Don't look at you. Don't look at your hands. Don't look at what you have or haven't done. You keep looking at Christ. He's given us an understanding, and we're in him that's true. And when we're born again and given that understanding, Christ our wisdom gives us the understanding. That's when we believe, and that's when we start looking to him alone. To him alone. And then we start asking him, give me an understanding that I may learn my commandments. And he tells us, 1 John 3.23, this is his commandment. That we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. This is such a glorious thing to God's people. It is such a glorious thing when he makes you know this because the Pharisees were looking at all the commandments of the old covenant, over 600 commandments, and they were trying to come to God by those, and they were burdened, and they were heavy laden, and there's no way they could do it. They sinned in their mother, and they were conceived in sin. And... Christ comes to you. The Lord gave him understanding, and he did all the commandments of God, all those old covenant commandments, and took away the first and established a new law, the everlasting covenant of grace. And he comes to you just like he came to Abraham. That's the beautiful picture. Paul, quote, spent three chapters in Romans saying, there is none righteous, no, not one. When you condemn somebody else, you are just opening your mouth and condemning yourself because you do the exact same thing in every way at all time. So there's no point in trying to exalt one over another. No point. He spent three chapters saying there is none righteous, no, not one. That means at any point <laughs> in our life, we can't come to God in any righteousness of our own. We don't have any. We're not good at any point in any point in our life because we have a sin nature that's only sin and only sins. And then he used Abraham as the example. Abraham was 430 years before the law at Sinai was given. And he said, we're not making void the law. Christ said, I didn't come to make void the law. I came to fulfill it. And he said, and we're fulfilling it the same way Abraham did before it was ever even given at Sinai. How's that? Christ comes to you and he gives you understanding. He said, this is my commandment. Believe on me. And you are the righteousness of everything that law demands. You believe unto righteousness. That, that's the best news you'll ever hear. When he shows you what a sinner you are and that you can't do anything to keep that law, he makes you to see, believe me, and he gives you the spirit to do it and understanding. And that's when he puts love in your heart for your brethren because... You begin to see at that point, my brethren are sinners. They're sinners just like I am. And God's been merciful to me. So I need to love them. What, what's, what did God do to me? He came and gave me an understanding of Christ and said, believe me, what I need to do for my brethren. Tell them what Christ has done for us again and say, just believe him. And he'll do that. He'll work that. He's the answer to every problem we have, brethren. Every problem we have. We're looking at him in this psalm to see how he's going to make you and me learn and follow him right here. All right, now thirdly, go back with me, thirdly. When we're given reverence for the Lord, when he's given us understanding, that's when we're made glad. That's when we're made glad. You ever heard, Brother, I think I told you, Scott, Brother Scott Richardson said, I, there ain't been any bad news since I heard the good news. And he had a, he had a really a lot of affliction in his life, a lot. And he meant that. Because even when you're afflicted and you're sad and sorrowful because of your flesh and all, you still have that joy Christ gave you. You know you're his. I'm getting ahead of myself. But he gives you this gladness and and. Here's why we have it. Because when Christ walked this earth, he makes you to know this, when he walked this earth, he only looked to the Father. And he hoped in the covenant word of the Father. And he did it in perfection for us, in perfect faithfulness. Christ said to the Father, verse 74, They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. 
All this we've looked at so far, him praising God for making him, him asking God to give him an understanding that he may uh, keep the commandments for his children. He, he was hoping in God's covenant that all those things we just read, that God said, I'm going to do all this for you. I'm going to teach you this. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to grow you. I'm going to do all this for you. He hoped in his word, and he did it perfectly. And when you see him, he said, when they see me, they're going to be glad because I hoped in your word perfectly and fulfilled the everlasting covenant for his people. Christ said to the Pharisees, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw and was glad. <laughs> That's what Christ said. When they see me, they're going to be glad. They're going to be glad. And the Pharisees, you, you're not even 50 years old. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. When they picked up stones to try to kill him. We believe and we're glad and we hope in Christ because he's our righteousness. <laughs> he is our righteousness. When it says we're complete in Christ, that means we have, we have dotted every I and crossed every T of God's law. That's what righteousness means. There is no record of sin in God's book toward his people. He has blotted it out. He's our righteousness. And so in every affliction, here's how he is our righteousness. This is how he hoped in the Lord. In every affliction he faced, the moment he's born, they try to kill the Children, male children two years and under. They take go down into Egypt. All his life, the devil's trying to kill him. The devil's trying to kill him. Those Pharisees picked up stones to throw at him, trying to kill him. He went out of their midst, couldn't touch him. And every affliction he went through, and even the affliction of the cross, when he was bearing the sin of his people and, and bearing the curse in our place, this is what our Lord Jesus said faithfully right here, verse 75. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. Brethren, that's an easy thing to say when the lyrics to that song are not happening to you. But when they are, that's a hard thing to say. And we don't ever say it in perfection because there's some part of us that don't want to be in it. And we're thinking, what are you doing, God? That's just fact. And that's enough sin to send you to hell for a thousand eternities. But he came to manifest that the Lord's judgments are right. The margin says righteousness. <laughs> that's all God does is righteousness. We don't have any righteous judges in our day. They're making backroom deals and, you know, judgments corrupted. I mean, we don't know much about it. We go to court if we, you know, something happens to one of our kids. We go to court trying to get them not to do justice. Be merciful to us. The judge, the earthly judge, can't show you mercy and be just. It ain't his business. His business is to, to pour out the penalty of the law on you. And, uh, but God does judges. He judges right. He everything he does is righteousness, and he does it in faithfulness. He said, "Thou." Thy judgments are right, and thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. He said, I know this. He knew it perfectly. That understanding God gave him, and he glorified God for it. Because he's manifesting God's righteousness. That's what he came for, brother. The, that's the gospel. That's what the gospel's about, is God's righteousness. His holy character, and how he is the judge that always does right. That's what the law is about, to show me and you can't ever do right if we're trying to come by the law. It declares us guilty and shuts our mouth, but the law shows us Christ who only did right in perfection. And then he goes to the cross and he's bearing the wrath, the sin of his people and the wrath of God, and he declares to God in perfect faithfulness, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. And now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, 
in Christ's stead. We're standing here in place of Christ saying, be ye reconciled to God. Quit fighting God. Quit fighting men. Quit fighting. Be reconciled to God. Lay down your shotgun, Brother Henry used to say. Pour water on all your gunpowder. The warfare is over. It's accomplished. Why did he not impute sins to us? Why is he not imputing our trespasses to us? If God doesn't impute something to you, if he don't impute sin to you, it's because there is no sin to impute to you. That's what imputation is. If God, God only imputed sin to me and you because Adam made a sin. And if God won't impute trespasses to you, it's because you don't have any to impute. Now, how can that be? 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He declared God just. Lord, I know you're righteous. In faithfulness you're afflicting me. Showing your righteousness and your faithfulness because no man could manifest your righteousness or your faithfulness. None of my people could. Every fallen son of Adam, none of them could show forth your righteousness and your faithfulness. You sent me to do it, Christ said, and you're afflicting me in perfect righteousness and perfect faithfulness. See, that's the positive and negative side of the law together. He's, he's putting away our sin, and he's justifying his people, and at the same time, he's loving God and praising God and believing God with all his heart. That's his righteousness. And he hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And he did it so that the blessing of Abraham might come on us Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive God's promise, the promise he promised in that new law, the promise he promised, the spirit and faith to believe Christ. That's why he's doing what he did. So you could be given the spirit of God and brought to where Abraham was brought, where Abraham, God said, Abraham, I'm your righteousness. I'm going to give you everything. This was a heathen idolater who didn't have the law from Adam to Moses. He's thinking, how am I going to fulfill righteousness? Believe me, Abraham. Believe me. That's why Christ died, to give you that same promise he gave to Abraham. And he said when the law entered, when Sinai came and, and the law, old covenant entered, he didn't change that everlasting covenant promise. It didn't alter it one bit. God gave the law to shut our mouths to show us what we are. It didn't change it. The promise is to Christ. And for Christ's sake, he gives it to his people for his righteousness' sake. So when he finished the work, God, according to his promise, he, rose, he had raised him to his right hand and having made his people with his hands now. That's how Christ made us with his hands. We pray, started praising him for making us with his hands. That's how he did it. And he, what he did in that is he made us entirely righteous, a new creation, entirely righteous. But we wasn't born yet. In time, we were born physically, but we were dead in sin and corrupt and just a ball of iniquity. We still wasn't born yet. How are we going to know this? He's going to have to create a holy man. And so he sent the spirit into your heart, the spirit of his son into your heart, and a new man was created entirely by the hand of our Lord Jesus, by the spirit of our God, Holy Spirit, and made a holy man. You either are holy or you're not. You're either alive or you're dead. You're either a man or you're not a man. You, you, you can't be part of... part. You, when he makes you holy, you're holy. You're going to grow in that state of holiness, but you're holy. That child, when conceived in the womb, had everything in it that it'll ever be. And when he makes you to be conceived with an incorruptible seed. Everything you will ever be as a child of God is in that, in that new man. And that's when you praise him and stop praising yourself. That's the evidence of a holy heart. We stop looking at ourselves. 
We stop looking at others. We start, stop, we start glorifying him for everything. He gave us an understanding and faith to believe him, and he made us see. That's the thing about this new holy heart, too. When I hear people talking about their holiness and bragging about what they've done, when you got a holy heart, you see that in your flesh dwells nothing good. Everything you do is sin. you got sin mixed with it. A holy heart, I tell you what it does, it makes you look out of yourself and believe Christ is my only righteousness. That's when Christ has really been made sanctification to you and righteousness to you because God makes you know, I'm robing you like I robed Adam. I'm imputing to you everything he did because in him you did it all. You did it all. He made us glad to see that by Christ, hoping in God's word and obeying God, we're righteous and holy. And so we hope in Christ. We're not... We're not hope. We're, well, yeah, we're hoping in the same word the Father made to Christ. We're hoping in all those covenant promises the Father made to His Son, that Christ, uh, the Father through Christ, will give us all those covenant promises because He promised them to His Son, and His Son fulfilled everything. So He's going to give His Son everything He promised His Son, which includes a people that are going to be His and be with Him forever. And so we're hoping in that same word. With Christ. And he makes you one with your brethren because this is it. We only have one hope. We only have one hope. We're not, I'm not, my hope's not in you. You're going, if I put my hope in you, you're going to disappoint me. If you put your hope in me, I am going to disappoint you. I already have. My hope's in Christ. That's the only place my hope is. And that's how he makes brethren that can't get along, that are got rough edges and sin and fall and stumble and do everything. That's how he keeps you together. And that don't mean he's going to keep you together with the same ones the whole time, but he's going to keep his brethren together. So he's growing us in understanding through the things we suffer. And when you behold God's righteousness and his faithfulness in Christ and you hear Christ praising God when he suffered affliction. He brings you to see that when he's afflicting you, and there's all different kinds of affliction, sometimes it's because of your sin. Usually it's always because of our sin because we, we sin in all the time. We need something. We need to be taught more of him all the time. But sometimes it's, it's you know, loss of loved ones or whatever and loss of a job. But he's, what he's teaching you he sees your separation, and he's keeping you separated. You put too much confidence in that job. You put too much confidence in that man. You put too much confidence in that work. You put too much confidence in whatever it is that you thought that, well, this, it starts growing to be a little, going to be my salvation here. Nope, he's going to kick that crutch out front of you and show you I'm your separation. I'm the one keeping you and not going to let you go. And that makes you now when the affliction's over, and he's blessed it to your heart, sanctified it to your heart. That's what makes you say, Lord, I know your judgments are righteous. And in faithfulness, you've afflicted me. I know that. You still don't say that perfectly, but, but you do know it. And he's growing you to know it more and more. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, David said in verse 65. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according to your word. We sing, it is well with my soul. If you hadn't heard that message, go listen to it. Especially that Joseph Spafford, that he lost everything except his wife. Thou hast dealt well with my servant, O Lord, according to your word. Before I was afflicted, I was going astray, but now I've kept thy word. Well, you won't need to be afflicted anymore then. Read the last verse of the psalm. Lord, I've gone astray like a lost sheep. <laughs> Come save me. Come save me. And that's what he's going to do. You know, the, see, he's the shepherd. <laughs> that means he's going to shepherd you. And without him, you're going to be that sheep that they pull out of the ditch. And within five seconds, you're back in the ditch. He's going to shepherd you. And he's making you see he's your shepherd more and more. Now, lastly, uh, I'm out of time. But I'll, I'm going to briefly go over these because I just want you to see them in the context of what I just preached to you. Maybe we'll look at them more in depth another time. But. 
this is, these are three requests that he made when he suffered on our behalf, and as we suffer, he's teaching us to obey him by asking these things of him. Christ asked this of the Father, and Christ is teaching you and me to ask this of the, fa uh, of the Father for his sake when we suffer. Our Savior depended upon God the Father's merciful kindness, and he's teaching you and me to call on him for the same thing. He said in verse 76, let, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort. According to thy word unto thy servant, let thy tender mercies come to me that I may live, for thy law is my delight. God's law is our Savior's delight. The whole law of God, all the, everything in the old covenant, all the everlasting covenant of grace, every word out of God's mouth is his delight. And in our new heart, we delight in every word of God. But what we greatly delight in is that everlasting covenant of grace where God says everything's ordered and sure and you're perfect in me. But he fulfilled that law, every jot and tittle. But as he did it, God the Father comforted our Savior in merciful kindness and tender mercies the whole way through. And now he lives forevermore. He said, do this that I may live. And now he lives forevermore. That's how dependent Christ was on his Father when he walked this earth. He lived by the mercies of God. And he's teaching you and me the only way you're going to live is by the mercies of God. God promises when you come to him through Christ for the sake of his son, he'll show you merciful kindness. He'll show you tender mercies. And he don't ever stop showing mercies to his children. This is all our comfort. He never stops showing us mercies, 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 mercies. When he writes the law, this covenant of grace on our hearts, the law of faith and the law of love and the law of righteousness and the law of peace, we delight in the law of God and the new man. And he keeps us praising him by these tender mercies he keeps giving to us. He keeps us saying, Lord, thou art good. You're ready to forgive. You're plenty us in mercy unto all them that call on you. We're saved by mercy. And he keeps you knowing it. Right in the face of your sin, he keeps you knowing it. And he keeps comforting us with Christ, our consolation, and we keep giving in the glory. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our tribulation for we're able to comfort our brethren with the same comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God and that's the consolation of Christ Jesus. We could have all the luxuries in this world and, and a big yacht that could be parked out in the Caribbean and have everything, everything that the world could ask for and people say, and that's living. That's L-I-V-I-N right there. And you just be dead as a hammer. And you can be afflicted and poor and cast down and the world look at you and say, that's got, that would be death to have to live like that. But because of his tender mercies and the comfort of Christ in your heart, you live <laughs> and you rejoice. You live and you rejoice. He opens the word to you and he makes you open his word. Whatsoever things were written in the scriptures, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now, here's what I really want to show you. It's going to go a little long, but I'm sorry. You with me? You still with me? This is important. We're talking about mercy. We're talking about mercy. This is so important. So, receiving the Father's merciful kindness, Christ delighted in mercy. He delighted to be merciful to others. And he's teaching you and me to do that. Teaching us to do that. Verse 78. Let the proud, hear Christ speaking now, let the proud be ashamed for they dealt perversely with me without a cause. But I'll meditate in thy precepts. Let those that fear thee turn unto me and those that have known thy testimonies. Now some of the proud, when our Lord walked this earth, they were not our redeemers. They were not God's elect. And our Lord Jesus trusted the Father to deal with them. He trusted the Father to deal with them. While they were Proud and dealing perversely, he said, I'll meditate in our precepts, and he focused on God's word. But what about those that were his who were proud and dealt perversely with him? You see, in our unregenerate state, that's all we are is proud. 
You know, we're right, their best is wrong. Look at them, look at them transsexual people, you know. They, 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 ugh. That's just saying, I'm better than they are. Proud. You're no better than they are. I ain't either. Find you another bathroom. Solve that problem. Don't let that be your problem. But we're all proud by nature. But in our regenerated state, our sinful pride is with us constantly and takes us over. But his prayer to God is, let those that fear thee turn unto me and those that have known thy testimonies. Remember what the Spirit bears testimony to? He'll bear testimony of me. Them that know me, that you've taught me, that I'm their salvation, turn them to me, the Lord said. When, we walk, when he walked this earth, what spirit did our Lord have concerning proud, unregenerate men? Well, you can know that by what precepts he taught you and me. He said, pray for your enemies. When James and John wanted to cry down fire on those who dealt proudly and perversely with our Lord Jesus, he turned and rebuked them and said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. The Son of Man's not come to destroy men's lives, but to save. That's the spirit in which he prayed in our psalm. And we see the manner of this spirit when we see one that was dealing proudly and perversely with him, and how for Christ's sake, God answered our Lord's intercession and turned him to Christ and made him glad. You look to those two thieves on the cross, and they're both just dealing perversely and proudly. One of the malefactors which was hanged railed on him, saying, if you be the Christ, save yourself and us too. And the other, all of a sudden, He'd been doing the same thing, dealing proudly and perversely. And he answered and he said, don't, don't you fear God? Seeing that thou art in the same condemnation. And we're in this justly. We can always say that. We're in this justly. We receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt be with me today in my kingdom. Here's the precepts the Lord's going to bring us to meditate in. God's mercy to us. Constant, continual, merciful, kindness, tender, mercies. God told David and all the saints of old, and he teaches me and you did, you deal mercifully with the stranger. David knew the heart of a stranger. He said, you know the heart of a stranger. Be merciful to him. And David knew it because David, even as a believer, had stood as the proud dealing perversely with God and with men. He had done that. You have to. You have to. You may do it today before it's over. So you know the heart of a stranger. But God in mercy restored David in his merciful kindness and his tender mercies. And so when he's being dealt with by the proud, being dealt with perversely, the Lord brings you to focus in on Christ, focus in on his word, focus in on how he's been merciful to you, the sinner, and that's what he'll bless in your heart to make you deal mercifully. You're going to deal proudly and perversely. And that's how he's going to show it to you over and over, that his mercies never end. But that's how he's going to make you be more merciful. And that's why he brings us, he brings us to this last verse. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes that I be not ashamed. David had a lot of reason to be ashamed. He looked on his past and he had a lot of reason to be ashamed. You and me do too. I, I have I, things I never wanted to happen. I'm so ashamed. But you know what it made David do? It made him say, Lord, I need you to let my heart be sound. You notice all these lets? Ain't nobody saying we're going to let God do something. 
They're begging God, God, will you let me? Will you let me? And all his falls and his trouble made him know, God, I need, to let, I need you to let my heart be sound. Let me believe you more. Let my heart rejoice in your mercies more. Let my heart be more merciful. Let my heart hope in your word more and know all is well with my soul. Let, me, let my heart be sound and know when you afflict me, you're doing what's right and you're being faithful to me. Let my heart be sound, Lord, to hate my sin more. Let it be sound because if I err in any of these ways, I'm going to be ashamed. Lord, let my heart be sound so I won't be ashamed today. Let my heart be sound so I won't be ashamed tomorrow or in the future. That's where he brings you. That's where he brings you. Amen. We're going to observe the Lord's table. This is open to anybody who God has revealed this gospel to, and this is your Savior. Um, We're going to remember him, remember him, remember these things you just heard about him as you take this table. Uh, Brother Ben, <clears throat> Brother John, you know, pass these out. <clears throat>